Buonasera, welcome to the Italian Cultural Institute of New York. Uh, Italo Calvino is one of the few Italian writers of the late 20th century who is well known also outside Italy, and not only in the literary world. His fiction and non-fiction works, often not easy to distinguish, inspired why writers as well architects, designers, philosophers, etc., and gave a different image of Italy, not only related with the past, but aware of the new tendencies in art and science. Le lezioni americane, this is the title in Italian and remain my title, are one of the strongest exemplification of his way of thinking and working and their orientation toward the future is clearer in the English title, Six Memos for the Next Millennium. But the next millennium now is our millennium, and it's interesting and stimulating to read again what Calvino thought it would be. Therefore, I accepted with enthusiasm the proposal of Giovanna Calvino, his daughter, to celebrate the new translation of the memos. We decided, <coughs> together with Noreen Tomasi of Center for Fiction, to organize five events in different locations, five as the words Calvino chose as important for the literature of the future. Lightness, quickness, exactitude, visibility, multiplicity. The first was in Brooklyn with Jonathan Lidham, and this is the second with Paolo Antonelli, senior curator in the Department of Architecture and Design of the Museum of Modern Art, and many other things in the world of design, and Maria Popova, the founder and editor of an extremely popular blog, Brain Pickings, that I discovered recently, but now is one of my favorites. The other uh, events will be at Albertine, Center for Fiction, and Rizzoli Bookstore. As many of you know, Calvino couldn't read his lectures because he died a few weeks before leaving to the US. That's the reason why we thought that it would be the best thing to close this celebration, reading the first lesson there where Calvino would have read it, at Harvard. And this will happen on 25th of April, and the reader will be a very important American actor. I don't know if Giovanna uh, would like to say the name or no. Um, and now I leave the floor to Giovanna Calvino. Thank you. Thank you, Giorgio. Is this on? Um, can you hear me? So before we talk about, before I give the floor to Paola and uh, Maria to talk about six memos, I wanted, without going too much off subject, because of everything that's happening in Washington these days, I've been thinking about the first trip that my father took to the States when he was uh, 35 years old with um, a Fulbright scholarship and he visited the he went he visited every state almost and he uh, met Martin Luther King he went to um, uh, to Montgomery Alabama and I wanted to read you um, so he, he went to Montgomery, Alabama, and he was there during one of the first uh, protests of the first marches. And so even though it's a few pages long, I'm going to read you just small tidbits because I think it's, it's relevant today. I mean, it's Black History Month, but unfortunately it's relevant for other reasons because it looks like we are 
going back in, in time uh, politically. So um, this is, um, it's, it's like a diary. These are letters that he wrote to his friends in Italy uh, recording his, uh, his trip in America. So he says, you can, you can hear me, yes? It's eh? Ah, louder, <coughs> closer. Yeah, no, I, uh, I can speak louder. So, um, <laughs> Montgomery, Alabama, March 6th. Um, this is a day that I will never forget as long as I live. I saw what racism is, mass racism, accepted as one of, the, uh, uh, as one of society's fundamental facts. Um, so he's talking about a student's protest um, that happened, so they wanted to march because a number of students had been um, ex expelled from the university and under the leadership of um, Abernathy, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Aberna, um, and they weren't able to march because they were uh, assaulted by the, the white mob. Um, and so he happened to be there then. Mm, so he said, I was present at one of the first episodes of mass, ra of mass struggle by the southern blacks, and it ended in defeat. And, and then he goes on to talk about his meeting uh, Martin Luther King He says, um, he is a very stout and capable person, physically resembling Bourguiba. He was a, a Tunisian um, prime minister, or prime, um, with a little mustache. The fact that he's a pastor has nothing to do with his physical appearance. Um, so my father was a young provincial man coming from Italy. You have to understand that he's, he was a, a very much an outsider. Mm, these are politicians whose only weapon in, is the pulpit, and even their nonviolence does not really have a mystical aura about it. It is the only form of struggle possible, and they use it with the controlled political skill which the extreme harshness of their condition has taught them. Um, so he said uh, they are lucid, decisive, uh, totally devoid of self-pity, not terribly kind, though of course I was an unknown foreigner who had turned up to nose around in days which were very eventful for them. Um, and he describes the crowd. Uh, he describes these, um, how these uh, students um, are locked up in the church and, and the people, he says, oh, sorry. The pavements were swarming with whites, mostly poor whites who are the worst racists, ready to use their fists young hooligans working in teams, their organization is the Ku Klux Klan, but also comfortable middle-class people, families with children, all there to watch and shout slogans and obscenities against the blacks locked inside the church. Uh, the crowd's attitude varied between derision, as though they were watching monkeys asking for civil rights, genuine derision, from people who never thought the blacks could get such ideas in their heads. Two hatred, cries of provocation, crow-like sounds made by the young thugs. Mm. So the, the whites, uh, they, are, they do these choruses of threatening and obscene sneers, insults and gestures. At every insult or joke made by a white, the other whites, men and women, burst out laughing, sometimes with almost hysterical insistence, but sometimes also just like that, affably. And these people, as far as I'm concerned, are the most awful, this, this all-out racism combined with affability. 
um, and he talks about the, he says, um, naturally, I have come here also with introductions to extremely racist, ultra-reactionary, high society ladies. And I have to divide my days with acrobatic skill so that they do not suspect what a deadly enemy they are harboring in their midst. Above all, whites are forbidden by law from entering blacks' houses or getting into a car with them. Um, so the, these ladies hint vaguely at the day's troubles caused by that agitator, Luther King. This famous southern aristocracy gives me the impression of being uniquely stupid in its continual harking back to the glories of the con conf conf Confederacy. Um, in the tone of someone who is confident you share their emotions. This is something which is more unbearable than ridiculous. Okay, so this was just to give you an idea by mm, mm, jumping around these pages. So um, maybe um, the speakers will actually also talk about um, Calvino's trip to the United States, so I haven't veered too much of, uh, of course. Thank you. Buonasera. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Giovanna. This was um, quite timely. Um, and I think ties into the six memos in a very unusual way because where he talks about the derision, I think what upsets him the most is the profound failure of imagination on behalf of racist people who cannot imagine that other human beings could want the same rights as them. And that same insistence on the imagination is what's at the heart of the six memos for the next millennium. Uh, but I wanted to read, I had pulled out, before I knew you were gonna read this, something else that he wrote in a letter upon his first visit to America um, to a friend, he writes, he had gotten this grant from the Ford Foundation to travel to America and, and write. And he ended up destroying the book that um, he had meant to, to write at that time. Uh, but it kind of survives in fragments in the letters. And in one of them he says, a quarter of America is a dramatic, tense, violent country, exploding with contradictions, full of brutal psychological vitality. And that is the America that I have really loved and love. But a good half of it is a country of boredom, emptiness, monotony, brainless production, and brainless consumption. And this is the American inferno. And then he writes about New York. And, and Powell and I are both immigrants into New York. So it's so funny. That piece, <laughs> that piece it, it's quite funny. He says, New York has swallowed me up like a car carnivorous plant swallowing a fly. I have been living a breathless life for 50 days. Here, life consists of a series of appointments made a week or a fortnight in advance. Lunch, cocktail party, dinner, evening party. These make up the various stages of the day which allow you constantly to meet new people, to make arrangements for other lunches, other dinners, other parties, <laughs> and so on, <laughs> ad infinitum. Yeah, right. America, or rather New York, which is something quite separate, is not the land of the unforeseen, but it is the land of the richness of life, of the fullness of every hour in the day, the country which gives you the sense of carrying out a huge amount of activity, even though in fact you achieve very little. The country where solitude is impossible. I must have spent maybe just one evening on my own out of the 50 I spent here. And that was because my date with the girl that I had arranged for that evening fell through. Here, you have to order everything in advance. They're buying theater tickets for March now. And a girl, even if she happens to be your girl at present, has to know a week in advance that the evenings she's going to go out with you Otherwise, she, she goes out with someone else. <laughs> <laughs> and in that letter, he also talks about Harvard and the American universities in general, which brings us to his lectures, which many decades later, he would agree to go and speak at Harvard, which unfortunately he never got to do. But here, he, as a young man, first time in America, he says, Harvard is not America, but a kind of Olympus containing the intellectual cream from all over the world. And he talks about the universities in general um, seeing such an abundance of resources for research and a life so free from any difficulty in these garden cities can only make us think 
But might it not be th that the price for all of this is the death of the soul? And so he criticized the universities as being cut off from life, um, from the reality of life. Um, but at the end, <laughs> he, he ends the letter by saying, uh, giving this caveat, saying, well, I, of course, will uh, reserve the right to change my mind because this country is so complex and full of so many different elements. Uh, and this is just kind of a momentary impression. So clearly, he changed his mind to some degree by choosing to give the Charles Edward Norton lectures at Harvard um, toward the end of his life. Um, and this is what we're talking about tonight. No, we're talking quickness. I wanted lightness, but <laughs> <laughs> OK. No, no, no. They both work really well. Right. And, and it's interesting that we have such different entryways into Calvino's work, because I, um, I grew up in Bulgaria, and he did not make it there, really, when I was growing up. Um, and I got into his work through his nonfiction, his essays, his letters, his lectures, and Paola grew up with his <laughs> classic stories. Yeah, I, I brought it here because I wanted to show it to Maria, but this is my Fiabe Italiane, my Italian tales, and I basically grew up, of course I read everything else in the fiction side, but this one, really when I was a child I was illustrating it and these tales are scary because he went around Italy and he collected all these like oral stories so nothing was written it was the people in dialect that would tell him the stories they're mean and cruel like and Grimm's. bloody the and brothers did that whoa too. no much yeah. worse I mean yeah maybe collection. like the Grimm yeah of course mm -hmm. but I remember I was looking for it but I couldn't find it I don't know if it's still in Milan I had drawn this princess and she was chained she was wearing this like velvet dark green velvet dress she was chained and then there were flames that were coming up and I was just illustrating a little fairy tale right at age eight <laughs> yeah at age eight. <laughs> so um, so yeah it's interesting because I never approached Calvino from an intellectual academic standpoint to me it was always part of my life um, so it's fascinating now um, adult to read about all the nonfiction to read about the uh, Harvard lectures you know, it was just uh, another way to approach him and still I recognize him also in all this nonfiction I recognize his same amazing narrative power and the surprise that he could give you and also the measure because I've always had an allergy for surrealism, like I can feel surrealism and get an orticaria and get like, <laughs> like from afar. And even though he's always been so much into a fantastic world that could border onto surrealism, he never went there. He never took the easy route. So but he admired Borges tremendously well, and considered you know, him nobody's the perfect. <laughs> no, I like <laughs> Borges. The surrealism that I don't like is not literary, but rather, um, you know, artistic, more painting, artistic, etc. Yeah. But um, I never had that image from him. Mm. It's interesting that you say his ability to surprise, because I think that's such an element of his storytelling. And um, there's this one line in toward the beginning of the quickness lecture where he says, we might even say that any object in a narrative is a magic object. Oh, yeah, I know. And it made me think of how you approach objects. Design. As I, I, yes. I thought about it, too. It's, uh, no, read it better because it's... That's, uh, that's the, that's the yeah. sentence. It's a long, long passage, yeah, but that's true. what it says, uh, that any object is a magic object. But I, I was reading it, too. A few oh. years ago, in particular, I mean, I always say I'm, I'm a curator of design and I always tell people that I go through life as if it were a Looney Tunes cartoon because you know like the fire hydrant greets me in the morning and you know the the mailbox saying so I like your shoes you know so it's, it's all conversation like with the MTA like machine <laughs> pretty much yes but um, there was in particular an exhibition from 2011 that was called talk to me there was about the fact that people now want to have conversations with objects, that objects have, have always had a rapport with us, but now it's a, even more of a verbal rapport almost. But yeah, when I read that passage, I thought the same. You know, this mm. is really about design. You know? mm. <laughs> it's like what we see design to be. And at the same time, I mean, we think of objects as these kind of static entities, but for him it seems like 
Um, there's a, th they're in motion, there's a temporal element to them. They move through time and any object in a narrative is an object in time. And I think this question of time is really the animating question oh, yeah. of this lecture. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna read a little passage here. Oh, and actually about fairy tales. Heard this beautiful old book. Um, so he really extolled the economy of words in, in fairy tales as a real creative feat, uh, as a kind of exemplary elegance of storytelling. And he says, the chief characteristic of the folk tale is economy of expression. The most extraordinary adventures are recounted in terms of their bare essentials. There is always a battle against time, against obstacles that impede or delay the achievement of a desire or the recovery of a lost possession. Time can be stopped completely, as in the Sleeping Beauty. Mm -mm. The, this um, freezing of time. Ha what was your experience of it as a child, reading the folk tales and the fairy, fair, fairy tales? And did you have a sense of it? I wish I remembered what the sense of time felt like as a child. But um, I've always had no sense of time. Like collapses a bit. So in a way, um, this particular narration and uh, the kind of diachronic feeling that you get in tales is something that I experienced in my whole life. So um, I reread a few of the tales before coming here because I wanted to go back to that feeling. And it's true, there's an economy and there's a, a, a kind of um, um, disconnect between the fluidity of the time and the syncopated way in which I think it comes from the dialect in which the narration goes, that I can tell that time is expanding. But interestingly, you're right, it's objects that anchor or that play as uh, interlocutors with people and that give a different sense of time in the tales. And, 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 and the way in which I think he places the, the reader as, as an entity within the flow of time through the objects. And in the lecture, the quickness lecture, he spends quite a bit of time talking about Borges and his influence in his work. And um, I don't know how many of you have read, but if you haven't, I really recommend a Borges piece from, I believe, 1944 called The New Refutation of Time, um, in which he gives what is perhaps the most succinct and beautiful poetic definition or meditation on time. And in it, there's this line where it says, um, time is a river that sweeps me along, but I am the river. Time is a tiger that consumes me, but I am the tiger. Time is a fire that burns me up, but I am the fire. Um, and I think that is baked into all of Kilvano's short stories, where he really, you become time as a reader. That's so interesting, you're right, that's true. Um, I wanna read a little piece. Um, so m much, of the, m much of his writing in general, as we saw with um, the passage from his meeting, Dr. King, but so much of it is both timeless and, and extremely timely if you encounter it at the right moment. Um, so this is the part where he's talking about the acceleration of time by modern life. And um, literature is a kind of counterpoint to it, but also something that contributes to it at the same time. And he says, um, the motor age has turned speed into a measurable value. Oh, he talks about Galileo and how Galileo really um, saw the horse as a metaphor for time and, and more horses meant faster and, and there was this real value placed on greater speed. He says the motor age has turned speed into a measurable value with speed records marking the history of the progress of machines and men. But speed of mind cannot be measured and does not allow for comparisons or competitions nor can its results be ranked to give historical perspective. Speed of mind is valuable in itself for the pleasure it gives those susceptible to such pleasure, not for any practical use it can be put to. Fast thinking is not necessarily better than considered thinking, far from it, but it conveys something special that has to do specifically with its swiftness. And I, when I read this, I was reminded of a, there's a wonderful book by Rebecca Solnit from 2000 um, on walking, and in it she says, I suspect that the mind, like the feet, works at about three miles an hour. If this is so, then modern life is moving faster than the speed of thought or thoughtfulness. Hmm. So fascinating. I was and, he, and he's writing this, by the way, the modern age, at the time he's writing this, 
is the age before the internet. I know, that's what I was thinking today. And, you know, Giovanna, you might want to say something. I was thinking, what if he were alive today? How would he feel? Would he be ranting against it? Would he have embraced it and just, like, appreciated the capacity for lateral expansion of time that the internet can have? You know, it's... Did you have any... Well, in one of his letters, which I didn't bring, but I remember, he's talking about newspapers and the kind of tyranny of the constant input and how every morning he has this dance with the newspaper where he's trying to avoid it in order to <laughs> make time to write, but he's, <laughs> you know, the push and pull. So if he's having that much trouble with the newspaper, <laughs> know. you know, you kind of, wor you worry how, you know, I have these thoughts about a lot of people who were incredible creative geniuses who didn't live to this point in time, and I wonder, would they be able to do what they do if they had to combat the onslaught of demands and urgencies, and quickness takes on a different meaning then, I think. I guess so. Um, I don't know how many of you have been watching The Young Pope which I have been, no, you don't watch TV. No, it's like. What is The Young Pope? Oh, uh, yeah, exactly. No, it's a, it's a television a series. <laughs> it's a television series where things happen very slowly, uh, deliberately so. I mean, talk about surrealism that goes into that kind of territory. But uh, it, it's such, it's so rare to find slowness mm -hmm. that I really wonder um, if he would have been the last bastion of slowness, mm. right? Would he have become the champion or would he have given in? Well, that's interesting. Um, well, he, based on the quick, I mean, of course, his interest in time is as a storytelling device primarily and its role in storytelling, but it's inseparable <coughs> from a writer's life, I would say. Um, there's a passage where he talks about this notion of how we hog time or spend it, we treat it as a resource. He says, in real life, time is a resource we're stingy with. In literature, time is a resource to be disposed of in a casual, leisurely fashion. It's not a question of crossing some finish line. On the other hand, being thrifty with time is a good thing, since the, most time, the more time we save, the more we'll be able to lose. Quickness of style and thought means, above all, nimbleness, mobility, and ease, all qualities that go with writing that is prone to digression, to leaping from one topic to another, to losing the thread a hundred times and finding it again after a hundred twists and turns. The digression. The digression. Right? Yes, yes, yes. Right. It's so fascinating. The, um, the luxury of the digression. And then there were kind of, he was also mentioning Tristram Shandy and uh, the Italian translation of that particular novel. Well, um, and, and in that novel, there's a, there's a kind of a meta comment on digression that the narrator makes in Tristram Shandy, where he says digression is the sunshine of narrative, uh, which I, I, I was surprised that he didn't mention that because so much of w the point he's making revolves around that and this celebration of digression is something that adds to s the story as opposed to subtracting from it. And I'm, trying, I'm thinking New York is not a place for digressions, or at least not enough, or maybe it's a digression of a different narrative. It's about walking, mm. and it's about um, meeting other people. Maybe it's in the dialogue that we find the digression here. And how was, did you, were you had a, did you have a conscious sense of digression in the fairy tales as a child? No, it was, it was all, all about digressions. Yeah, yeah I mm -hmm. mean, there was no, right? I mean, it, it was, First of all, as children, we were not as overworked as children today, right? And uh, uh, digressions were built into our um, daily life, even practically and protectively so. Like, you know, when I was walking to school during the terrorist years, I had to decide whether I would walk on the left side towards Piazza San Babila or on the right side. And sometimes I would be with other friends, and if I were wearing a pea coat, they would say, oh, we better cross and go to the side of the Leonardo da Vinci, which was the liceo that was more to the r left. So, it, and, uh, and life was, was like structured. Was the symbol of something? The pea coat was left. And, uh, well, I'm, I'm doing left with the right because le le the Leonardo da Vinci was on the right, but you know, that it's was okay, the right. left. And instead, and instead, you're right. Uh, <laughs> sorry. And instead, the trench coats, the um, aviator ray bands, and the loafers were the Sambabilini, were the fascists. 
Wow. Yeah. But you so, had a pair of a aviator glasses. Right? Well, later on, <laughs> my dad brought them to me to the, from the United States. He didn't realize that they were scaring me. But you know, no. But um, it, it, it was really all in Italy was about digressions, and then you had some steady points. For instance, people knew that their friends would be at some bar at some point during the day, so they could stop by or not. So um, it's only in New York that I started living in a very victorial way. You mm. know, um, and uh, it's a different way of life. I don't know how Italy is right now, but I suppose it's still about digressions, at least a little bit. Um, I don't know if things have changed with the internet also there, but um, <coughs> I s it, it always gives me the impression that people have more time to digress. Hmm. Um, he he um, writes in the portion about Tristram Shandy, he says, Digre and this is, I think, the, the crucial point that he makes about digression. He says, digression is a way to postpone the ending, a proliferation of the internal time of a work, a perpetual attempt to escape. But to escape from what? From death, of course. So this notion that digression is a hedge against the ultimate ending, and as such, is, is a positive thing, is somehow a value as opposed to a detractor from the story, from life, from everything. I know, it's interesting because to me it was a surprise to hear it that way because I, from that analysis, I made digression coincide with procrastination and procrastination is not a hedge against death but rather it's a way to not deal with one's shortcomings and inadequacy, you know? So, or maybe it's the same but, hmm? I mean, I think that's a very self-punishing interpretation yeah. of procrastination. <laughs> I guess, I guess. Um, but procrastination is a kind of creative digression, in a way. If you want to say that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, in, the, in that letter, by the way, where he talks about the newspapers in the morning, uh, he talks about the, the burden of procrastination and how that's, you know, he procrastinates the procrastination of looking at the newspapers because he knows he's going to lose so much time, but then he puts that off and it becomes this kind of matrix of procrastination. And he, he wrote about it in a, in a negative way, meaning it was something that impeded his creative flow. But clearly it was a daily morning struggle, micro struggle that he had. So I think digressions and procrastination serve a purpose for us. If they didn't serve us, we wouldn't have them. Okay, let's think that. Maybe it can be <laughs> helpful. Um, I want to talk about this, um, maybe you have some insight into this. He uh, writes uh, that since uh, he was young, he adopted this Latin maxim, festina lente, m make haste slowly, as his motto. Um, what do you think about that? I think it is very sweet and very Italian of a certain era also, you know, so it's the idea of really enjoying the laziness and, uh, and trying to uh, make, to really treasure every single moment. It's about pleasure, it's about the pleasure of life in a way and being able to really appreciate it at every moment. So that's how I interpret it at least. Because mm. uh, also, once again, it was the first time that I was reading it here. Uh, it seems to me that he always has this kind of um, uh, controversial um, relationship with quickness. Like he wanted to write about it because everything was about the contrast between quickness and instead mm. savoring uh, yeah. slowness, right? So everything that he says sometimes is almost like um, uh, a way to make a play of words to communicate this, um, this kind of contrast, which I don't think is happening in the other memos, not as much. Well, in the lightness one, I think he does really emphasize the contrast, the necessary interplay of exactly. gravity and levity. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, you're right. And, and he, he says here, he says, from its beginnings, my work as a writer has aimed to follow the lightning fast course of mental circuits that capture and link points that are far apart in space and time. In my fondness of adventure stories and fairy tales, I've always thought something like an inner energy, a motion of the mind. And that passage reminded me of, um, th there's a lovely little book, unfortunately very terribly translated, um, of the, the painter Juan Miro, and he says, I work like a gardener. And he uh, uses this, uh, he calls it motionless movement. Nice. Which to me really very captures Japanese. Colvino's style though, don't you think? Uh, yes and no. I mean, when you say like a gardener and then you say motionless, what's the name of that uh, Japanese theater when 
that is about immobility. Uh, no, it's not. No, it's another one. Not. It's not even Kabuki. Darn. I'm gonna. I'm gonna figure it out for you. Huh? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. That is really. Is that is um, Wuta. It's called. Yeah. Buto, Buto, B U T O H. Okay, Buto. So that is about really, it's, uh, it's stillness, but you can tell that the energy inside is fighting and it's painful to watch, you know? And so I was thinking of that, and Calvino is definitely not that way. You know, to me, Calvino was never, I never considered him a quick writer, um, even though concepts came to me um, very strongly. They didn't come fast and furious, so there was time to appreciate them. So immobility is, um, is really almost death, and instead there was always a wonderful fluidity to mm -hmm. his writing. So I never thought of him as still. And not even as Gardner, because Gardner denotes a lot of patience. I don't think he doesn't strike me as a patient person. Was he patient, Joanna? Yeah, right. Yeah, it, and so, um, well, I love that idea of pruning, of gardening, of working that way, didn't seem to me like Calvino was that way. Well, I think he, he did a lot with the disconnect between who he was and who he aspired to be. Are you talking um, about the agronomist? <laughs> well, that, that, that is, um, yeah, he did so go to school for that. But uh, no, toward the end um, of the lecture, he talks about um, some certain myths about going from Borges to Carl Jung about Mercury and, and Saturn, and then he says, certainly literature would never have existed in, if some human beings had not been given to deep introversion, to dissatisfaction with the world as it is, to forgetting themselves for hours and days, their gaze fixed on mute, unmoving words. Certainly my own character shares some of the con conventional traits of my trade. I too have always had a Saturnine disposition, whatever other mask I might have tried to wear. Perhaps my devotion to Mercury reveals an aspiration, a desire to be. I am a Saturnine man who wants to be mercurial, and everything I write shows traces of both impulses. Yeah, so nice. It's kind of exactly what you intuited. Yeah, that's so nice. It's a really nice, it's a very Italian way to put it also, because looking mm -hmm. at the planets. And I was thinking, Maria, you, your life is about recognizing in the work of all these writers universal themes that then everybody can feel immediately. I mean, this is one of the things that you do. So I was thinking, when you, um, when you hear, when you read Calvino talk about introversion, and you hear him talk about um, all these different aspects, who does it remind you of? Where else have you found such beautiful um, narration of introversion and mm. I mean, th I think a lot, a lot of highly m masterful artisans of communication have been introverted people. But right now, who comes to mind most of all is Oliver Sacks. I think they had a lot in common. Yeah, I, I'm glad you say that because uh, I think it makes a lot of sense. Say more about it. Well, so Oliver Sacks, um, for those of you who don't know, was a uh, Magnificent neurologist, perhaps the greatest neurologist of the past many decades, um, and was also a phenomenal writer of uh, books about science, but extremely poetic lyrical books. He was really kind of a, a, a Dante of medicine, um, incredible person, very unusual in his personal life, just, just an odd genius, um, but wrote, wrote like an angel. And... Uh, one would think that these are different people, the private person and the literary persona, but of course that persona could have only sprung from that person if you actually think about it. And all the ways in which I think introversion fertilizes all these impulses to share um, that an extroverted person actually does not have in that way. This, this aching longing to connect um, with the outer world and also to give voice to, in Oliver Sacks' case, patients who were unseen, misunderstood, and just voiceless. Um, yeah. And in a way, I mean, what strikes me about Calvino throughout these letters, in the tales, etc., and also in his narration of America, is an amazing curiosity. 
Um, mm. I just see the images that I've always seen, these eyes that are always like piercing and looking for the next story that he could absorb. And, uh, and really also his nose that was always sniffing, right? You know, I don't know, I've never met him. He was myopic, that's why, okay. <laughs> but I, that's what I kind of recognize, the same longing mm -hmm. to listen to other people without maybe having to connect too much with them. And I understand mm -hmm. that, but at least to listen to them and to the stories they had to tell. And I think more than kind of resting pure information from the stories, he really had a sensitivity to the poetic and an insistence in the poetic in prose. Um, and actually he wrote in, in the quickness lecture toward the end, um, he writes about, he says, as for the writer of verse, so for the writer of prose, success is in the felicity of verbal expression, which can sometimes be achieved by a flash of inspiration, but which normally entails a patient search for the sentence in which no word can be replaced for the most efficient and semantically dense arrangement of sounds and ideas. I am convinced that writing prose should be no different from writing poetry. Both seek a mode of expression that is necessarily, that is necessary, singular, dense, concise, and memorable. And um, this, I, I confess I have the old translation of the book, which I didn't realize until today is actually a different translation. It's not just a different edition. Um, and there was one sentence that I loved in the old book that I just couldn't find in here. So I'm reading from the, the old translation. Um, he says, in the even more congested times that await us, literature must aim at the maximum concentration of poetry and of thought. Whoa, maximum concentration of thought is what strikes me. Poetry also, but poetry scares me. But um, it's, uh, it's really quite a declaration um, of intent. It's almost as if uh, there should be no dilution whatsoever. Don't waste your time, just listen to things that are worthwhile. It's very anti-digression, <laughs> almost, it, right? Well, it's also, I think, anti-opinion, because what's, um, what I read as implicit to this, the intersection of poetry and truth is not opinion, it's the opposite of opinion. You, the moment you succumb to opinion, you lose both truth and poetry. It's this mm. ready-made, and in one of his letters actually, um, I wonder if I can find it. Oh yeah, um, so in 1950, he was very young, and he wrote this um, kind of New Year's resolution, and in it he writes about the, the peril of, he says, commenting on something even before having to, the time to form an opinion on it. Yeah. Um, and then he writes, and I think this really ties us back to quickness and ties us back to this moment in time, politically and culturally, that we're all confronting. Um, he says, I would like this to signal the end of wasted angst in my life. I've, and, and this, by the way, 1950, in the aftermath of World War II, not a jolly time by any measure. Um, so I would like to signal the end of wasted angst in my life. I've never regretted anything so much as having particular individual worries, in a certain sense, anachronistic ones, whereas general worries, worries about our time, or at any rate those that can be reduced to such, like your problem in paying the rent, for instance, are so many and so vast and so much my own that I feel they are enough to fill up my worryability and even my interest and enjoyment in living. So from now on, I want to dedicate myself entirely to these latter worries. So he's talking about the wasted energy of worrying about uh, things that are not of grand personal, political, cultural importance, but which we do anyway. And I think procrastination is one such yeah. kind of petty human worry that is wasted energy. And then he says, I make several plans for myself to maintain my contacts with reality in the world, but being careful, of course, not to get lost in unnecessary activities and also to set up my own individual work, not as a journalist, but more as a scholar, with systematic readings, notes, comments, notebooks, a load of things I've never done before, and also eventually to write a novel. And shortly after this resolu resolution, he wrote his first uh, novel. It sounds like New Year's resolution. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh my God, I'm gonna lose 30 pounds, and I'm not gonna eat And all my worries. <laughs> and no worries. <laughs> 
What was the most um, surprising thing for you in the, wi the quickness lecture and, and his ideas on narrative? In well, that I really, um, uh, I, I always love it when I see uh, condensed thoughts that, and told really well, better than anybody ever could, thoughts that I might have also. So um, I really loved the part that you already kind of described, so the part about um, the, uh, the c kind of the balance between the quick and the, and, and the digression especially. Mm. I love the digression because um, I am personally, I'm always thinking, bringing things home. I'm sorry that I'm so self-centered, but I think that it's the best way to read literature somehow, to see how it reflects on you. Mm. And uh, uh, this continuous um, need to get rid of any digression is, I think, kind of toxic, and so it particularly resonated with me um, because I would like that to be my New Year's resolution to build more digression into my life. <laughs> so that's, to me, the most important one. Yeah, I mean, I think the human mind is a machine for digression. We work on these connections between things, and if we didn't, there would right? be no thought. Yeah. And what he says about the concentration of poetry and of thought, that is the poetic act. It's the associative chains of connection and metaphor and one thing generating another, generating another, that's the creative process itself, I would say. Now we call it the rabbit hole and we usually think it's about Google search. <laughs> 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 but in truth, yeah, I know. Yeah. But in truth, it's extremely important, I agree. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.